So, I will introduce our speaker. Now we've got to know each other. I, just before I do, just a reminder, um, in the public chat where you've just put where you're from, um, I would very much encourage questions um, for our speaker um, that I would be able to give to her at the end. So, Carolina Marland is a qualified nurse midwife and a PhD candidate at the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences. She has previously been working in Liberia, Western Africa, and now is halfway through her PhD. Her research is investigating the incidence of perinatal outcomes in immigrant women giving birth in Norway over a period of time of 26 years. The immigration is increasingly global and increased knowledge about the reproductive health in immigrant women is very important. The aim of this study was to gain updated knowledge about the incidence of hypertensive disorders in immigrant women giving birth in Norway during the period of 1990 to 2016. So I shall hand over to Carolina um, so that she can um, present just now. Welcome, Carolina. Thank you so much for that nice presentation, Marie. Yes, so my name is Carolina Malan, and my research, as Marie presented, is about adverse perinatal outcomes in immigrant women in Norway. These are my supervisors and also my co-authors for the articles. <clears throat> So what do we know about immigrants in Norway? Well, we know that first generation immigrants accounts for 14% of the total population and the immigrants comes from over 200 countries. 29% of all births in 2019 were to immigrant women. And as you can see from this picture, close to 50% of the immigrants in Norway comes from other European countries. Just over one third of the immigrants comes from Asia and 14% comes from Africa. Most of the African immigrants in Norway are born in the sub-Saharan region. People immigrate for different reasons. It could be due to work, education, family reunion or establishment, or they come as refugees. Immigrant women are a heterogeneous group with different background and risks for perinatal outcomes. We often refer to reasons for immigration as for push or pull factors. People moving to something like for work or educational reasons more often have a stronger socioeconomic background and better health outcomes than the ones moving away from something like refugees moving from natural disasters, war or famine, for example. We know that immigrant women have an elevated risk for hypertension, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, preterm birth, and stillbirth, among other things. And the possible explanation for the differences in perinatal outcomes are many. And my studies does not focus on causation as it is an epidemiological study. But from previous research, we know that differences may be due to socioeconomic background, inadequate food intake, inadequate communication, both language-wise and due to cultural impediments, low health literacy, low follow-up in medical advices and medical treatments, and immigrant women may experience a low trust in the health system, leading to an unsatisfactory use of the service. Increasing international immigration calls for increased knowledge about the health of immigrants. And for my study, this includes more knowledge about the reproductive health for immigrant women in Norway. Even though we do have some knowledge, there is a knowledge gap in the research, as previous epidemiological studies often lack specific information on maternal country of birth and not just race or ethnicity, as it would capture just a small picture and a lot of information will get lost. There is a lack of knowledge concerning reasons for immigration. And we also have limited information about length of residence when it comes to perinatal outcomes. 
So the study that I'm presenting here today was published in AOGS in December 2020. In this study, we uh, estimated the incidence of placental abruption in first-generation immigrants in Norway compared to non-immigrants in Norway by maternal country and region of birth, reason for immigration, and length of residence. And placental abruption, or simply abruption, is the premature separation of placenta before birth. It is a rare diagnosis, however, it is one of the most dramatic conditions during, during pregnancy. And globally, abruption is one of the leading causes of maternal death than due to hemorrhage. Abruption may be partial or complete. A partial abruption will increase the risk of fetal morbidity, whereas a complete abruption will lead to the fetal death within minutes as the fetal actually gets strangled. An abruption will also increase the risk of maternal morbidity, and in severe cases, it may lead to maternal mortality. The diagnosis is clinical and based on anamnesia or anamnesis and clinical findings like severe stomach pain and or vaginal bleeding. And oh, sorry. And the risk factors include the extremes of maternal age, parity, hypertension preeclampsia and smoking during pregnancy. And this is the time trend for abruption during our study. The total incidence of abruption in our study was 0.5% for the whole study period and for the whole study population. There was a significant reduction in the incidence, as you can see, during the study per, uh, period from 0.8% for Norwegian-born women in 1990 to less than 0.4% in 2016. It's the red line. <clears throat> and the tendency was the same for immigrant women, however, a somewhat lower reduction from 0.7% in 2019 to 0.5%. Uh, in 2016. My study is a nation, nationwide population-based study, and we use data from the Medical Birth Register of Norway and Statistics Norway. Data was linked using the national identity number of each woman, and we included all births in Norway from 1990 and throughout 2016, which gave us over 1.6 million births. And immigrant women accounted for 250,000 of all these births. <clears throat> Sorry. And this figure illustrates the derivation of our study sample. <clears throat> In order to reduce the heterogeneity within the groups, we included pregnancies to first generation immigrant women that is foreign-born women with one or two foreign-born parents, and Norwegian-born women. These are the, no the immigrants, and these are the Norwegian-born or non-immigrants. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's early in the morning. I haven't spoken much yet. And the inclusion criteria um, for countries, which countries to include in the study, uh, was based on um, the number of births or abruptions during the study period. So to ensure strength of the study, we included countries with 6,000 births or more during the study period. But in order not to lose countries that have a high incidence of abruption but low birth rates, we also included countries with at least 15 abruptions during the study period. The countries that did not meet the inclusion criteria were marched into a separate exposure group coded as other countries. And Norwegian-born women or non-immigrants were used as a reference group for all analysis. And for the more technical part, the methodology, we estimated crude and adjusted odds ratios with 95% confidence interval 
using binary logistic regression models. Adjust adjustments were made for year of birth, maternal age at birth, parity, chronic hypertension, and level of education. And to account for dependency among pregnancies to the same woman, we used robust standard errors that allowed for within mother clustering. We assumed missing values to be missing at random, and missing values were imputed using a multivariate normal model with five imputations. And we used a statistical program called STATA for all analysis. So when aggregating our data according to the seven super regions of the global burden of disease, we observed an increased risk of abruption in immigrant women born in the sub-Saharan region, while the lowest incidence was found in immigrants from Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and cent or Central Asia. And this is when compared to non-immigrants. So as I said, immigrant women from the sub-Saharan region had the highest incidence and odds ratio, 4% abruption, and the lowest incidence was found in immigrants from Central Europe, Eastern Europe, or Central Asia. We did not find any association between length of residence or reasons for immigration and placental abruption. But it's interesting to see that refugees refugees and women immigrating for work reasons have the same elevated risk of abruption supporting the well-known hypothesis of the healthy immigrant where only the healthiest people will leave their country or survive the journey and reach the receiving country and that gives us a bias in the estimates So we included countries based on the inclusion early, I explained earlier. And the uh, adjusted odds ratio for placental abruption by maternal country of, of birth relative to non-immigrant women illuminated a strong association for immigrant women born in Ethiopia with an odds ratio of 2.39. A higher odds ratio was also fine for Brazilian women but as you can see, the confidence interval was wide, making the result more uncertain. So to conclude, in our study, we found that immigrant women from sub-Saharan Africa and especially Ethiopia had an increased incidence of placental abruption after immigration to Norway. We did not find a profound variation in placental abruption uh, by reason of immigration or length of residence in Norway. And does this research has any, any clinical relevance? Yes, we think so. We think that this research is uh, of clinical importance for doctors. Did I not change? I'm sorry. We think that this uh, research is of clinical importance for doctors and midwives in the antenatal care who should strive to support women to achieve a healthy lifestyle <clears throat> and optimize of nutrition during pregnancy and to provide targeted information on early signs and symptom of, uh, symptoms of abruption for immigrant women from sub-Saharan Africa and especially Ethiopia during pregnancy. Thank you all for the attention. Thank you, Carolina. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I am particularly um, taken with the amount of work that you've put into that. Um, and I will be inviting um, people to put any questions um, in the public chat, please. Um, so Catherine's just um, thanking you. So again, thank yous through. Whilst they come through, 
Um, I have a couple of questions, if that's all right with you. Yeah. Um, so um, in the UK, um, we had the we have the Embrace um, report, which has um, shown shown disparities um, and possible systemic racism um, within midwifery care. I was wondering, uh, as you were going through those slides, um, you were talking about um, disparities between um, European-based immigrants and those um, from areas such as Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, I wonder whether or not the, there is an aspect of systemic, possible systemic racism um, within Norway, and I'll be interested to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yes, thank you, Marie, for that question. Well, I think um, the the systematical or the structural racism is not that strong in Norway as we might see in in the United States or the UK, for example, or in England at least. Uh, we do have a lot of governmental hospitals and not so many private ones. Uh, but I still think that there is a, a possibility of of so-called structural racism in Norway as well, as we um, do not use the in interpreter services as much as we should do, I think, and maybe especially during pregnancy. Uh, I know that we use interpreters quite a lot in antenatal care and also postpartum, but not during admittance to the hospitals and not during the labor or not in labor ward. We don't use interpreters as much as we should. Uh, and I think that's a shame actually, that we're not um, allowing every woman to have the same right to express herself or to um, understand the information given in a proper way from a, from a qualified interpreter. Uh, so I think the answer is that the structural racism is not that strong as you might see in other countries but i still think that we do have quite a long way to go still to gain equality in in antenatal or in in maternal care maternity care in norway as well thank you carolina um and i i expect that um the evidence that you you have gathered will will help in some way to Towards supporting that work, so thank you for that work. Um, we do have um, some questions within the chat box. Um, so um, Gaksu um, asks, have you found any relation between placental abruption and pre-existing medical conditions within the cohorts? Well, thank you. Thank you, Gaxo, for that question. We we did not we did not look for any any relation between abruption and pre-existing medical conditions, but we do know that we have uh, quite a lot of risk factors um, like chronic hypertension and um, preeclampsia during pregnancy. Diabetes might be a, a risk factor. So we do we do know that we have some medical conditions that are um, more of a risk factor for placental abruption in pregnancy. Is that an answer to your question? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a, another um, question from Joanne, who is interested to see how many pre prenatal visits the different groups had and if that was part of your your research yes thank you joanne that's very interesting it was not a part of my research but we did discuss it within the research group uh, i think that's very important um, unfortunately it's not that well registered um, in, in the medical birth register of norway um, but it's it's it should be recorded. It should be recorded properly, and it is very interesting. We know from previous research that, uh, especially women from sub-Saharan Africa and Somalia, more specific, uh, do have less consultants during antenatal care or during pregnancy than non-immigrants and 
compared to other immigrant groups as well. And we know that they, the, the total group of immigrants, and especially women from Somalia, usually come later to first antenatal care uh, visits, either to the doctor or to the midwife. Um, and we know that that may delay the uh, any medical treatment or detection of, of risk factors that may actually prevent an abruption or at least give her enough information to contact the labor ward early enough to hopefully save the baby. So yes, I think that's that's it's very important to to know the 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 number of visits in during uh, during pregnancy for for these women. Thank you. Um, Catherine has um, the question of, do you have any thoughts about continuity of care in order to reduce complications like abruption? Well, thank you, Katrine, for that question. I think um, there is little research on, on the continuous of, of care in Norway because we don't actually use it that much. Uh, we know from from other countries and other studies that it's uh, it's preventive for a lot of of different outcomes. Most definitely, um, I would say for placental abruption, it's it's probably not preventive, but still it can it can help with the outcomes and making the outcomes less severe. Um, as we know, uh, as midwives uh, during an abruption, the baby. If you have a complete abruption, the baby will actually die within four or five minutes. Uh, so you need to come quickly to the hospital and you need to, to make a C-section and get the baby out as quick as possible. Um, if you don't have that information as a woman or if you don't know what to look for and signs and symptoms, um, you may come late and a continuous care could, could probably help with that. Uh, and inform you in a correct way so that you are actually contacting the antenatal or the labor ward quick enough. So I think the answer is that um, for placental abruption itself, it would not probably not be preventive, but for the outcome, most definitely. Thank you, Carolina. Um, Linda has asked, um, in many countries, um, antenatal care is not commonplace. So are there specific advertisements to the women um, that are coming in as immigrants that antenatal care is actually available to them? Yes, thank you, Linda. That's a very good question. I think, um, I think if you're pregnant when arriving, at least in Norway, if you're pregnant when arriving, you will have the the antenatal care follow up uh, done properly because you will be in in uh, in an ex or an um, what do you call it when when you when you just arrive, you will come to to a place where someone will actually take care of your medical um, concerns. And you will probably get help to get to antenatal care as well. Whereas women who had just settled down in Norway, maybe not have been here for such a long time or in other countries as well, um, are left to themselves in another way. So I think the, the biggest risks for immigrants are not when they're just arrived, but when they're just settled for themselves in a country, because then you're as I said, then you're left to yourself and then you have to um, try to figure out how to get to um, get the medical treatment that you need and where to where to look for it. And it could be a jungle to to understand um, the codes and and to find your way through the system. Thank you, Carolina. Um, Margaret has um, a question of, is there any relationship um, with, with domestic violence um, within this, the cohort and is, or is this not recorded? Yes, thank you, Margaret. It's, it's not recorded in, in uh, our 
um, in our study. But we know that domestic violence is, is quite common in some subgroups of immigrant women. Uh, and we know that domestic violence is a threat to um, placental abruption. And we, again, were discussing this in the research group, um, but there are no, there are no, it's not, it's not well recorded. Domestic violence is not well recorded. Uh, it might be the, the woman that doesn't want to record it. It might be that um, it's not actually uh, known to, to any, to anyone else than the woman, uh, that it's kept a secret within the family, which is most often the, the case. Um, so I think it would be really interesting to look at look into domestic violence a little bit closer. Um, but it's it's a it's a sensible topic to get into, and and I think it's quite quite difficult to do it during pregnancy, but it would be very interesting to see um, what domestic domestic violence might do for the perinatal outcomes in not just immigrant women, in Norwegian women as well. But yeah, it would be very interesting. Thank you. Um, Margaret says thanks too. Um, <laughs> in, um, Gaxu has another question. Um, in Norway, is antenatal care free of charge to all immigrant women? Yes, Gaxo, thank you for that question. In Norway, the antenatal care is free for all women, uh, Norwegian women and immigrant women. So you don't pay anything. Either you go, you decide yourself uh, or according to your medical history, if you go to a doctor or a midwife. And most Norwegians and most immigrants go to both doc a doctor and a midwife during pregnancy. And it's all free of charge. So it's going to the labor ward. It's no costs at all. That's wonderful. Um, I have um, a question myself too, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, I was I was wondering about the um, the possible link with FGM because I was I was curious about the sub-Saharan um, region um, cohort coming through. Um, and how that might um, impact how the um, abruptions are being picked up um, or subsequently treated. Do you have any thoughts to share about that? Yes, thank you, Marie. I think uh, FGM or female genital mutilation is, uh, we know that it's very common in, in sub-Saharan Africa and in Ethiopia uh, in particular. Um, we didn't record it in our uh, study because it's not uh, it's not recorded in the medical birth register of Norway, but we do have a lot of, of previous research on female genital mutilation. Um, I think I think the procedure itself may be a risk factor for abruptions later. I don't think it's a risk factor being uh, mutilized is a risk factor for abruption. But I think during the procedure, you may harm some, um, you may harm the anatomy uh, or you may leave scars. Um, you may wish to stop the bleeding. Um, and we know that it's quite common in Ethiopia to use herbs and using herbs um, maybe inside the uterus or inside the vagina during the cut um, may actually, we don't know, but you can speculate that this may, may actually leave um, either scars or, or some uh, damaged, damaged tissue that actually may cause an, or at least be an, a risk factor for abruption in later pregnancies. So yes, I think I think 
there is probably a connection even if we don't have it in our study i think there is an association in some kind of way for either either it may be female genital mutilation or um previous illegal abortions for example which may be more or less of the same um and i think that that could definitely be a risk factor for for abruptions in later pregnancies yes thank you carolina so that's a possible area for um future research um for, well, definitely yeah <laughs> that would be wonderful to be able to support women in that way um mm. Um, Kari has um, a question about the time period that abruptions occur um, in pregnancy. I wonder whether or not you could maybe comment on that. Yes, thank you, Kari. Um, it's it's recorded after the 20th uh, gestational week um, in the medical birth register, and we see that it's more common in the third trimester of pregnancy than than earlier in pregnancies or earlier in in the pregnancy so yes in at the end in the third uh, trimester it's more common than earlier thank you um I was wondering whether or not you could maybe talk a little bit about um, the theory of the healthy um, immigrants. You, you were saying that it would only be the, the healthy who made it to Norway. Um, and I was, I was wondering about if you could maybe talk about that a wee bit further. Yes, uh, most definitely. Thank you, Marie. Um, the, well, the healthy, the healthy immigrants uh theory or the theory of the healthy immigrants uh leaves us a bias actually when we're doing a research on immigrants uh, concerning the um the 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 cons um the the group of immigrants are not actually uh that representative to the rest of the region so we can't actually actually uh generalize our data saying that all women from ethiopia do have a lot uh, higher risk of uh, placental abruption than norwegian women for example because we we know that the women immigrating more often have a stronger uh health than the the women that are left in Ethiopia, because we, you don't, you don't go for, for the journey to another country if you're not healthy enough, or you will not survive the journey if you're not healthy enough. So we think that, or we know that we actually do get biases um, and can only generalize our data to, to the immigrant population in this country, because we don't, we don't know um the situation of the population within the country it could be worse but it could also be better we don't actually know and we also have we also have a bias called the salmon bias since we're in norway where you where we know that immigrants immigrants quite often um refer to as norwegians in spain as well if you get sick or if you get pregnant you want to go to your home country if you're able to to seek medical advice or medical help or to give birth to your baby because that's a system you know instead of staying in a country where you don't know the system you maybe don't know the the language and you don't have any family around you so again we will we will select like select the population the immigrant population to a more healthy immigrant population within the country than outside of the country. And that's the, the healthy immigrant, um, the theory of the healthy immigrant says that the immigrants are actually more healthy than the receiving population or the receiving country population. And that's, that's based on, on those theories that you actually, you get a selective population of immigrants 
in a receiving country? Was that an answer? That was a perfect answer. Thank you, Carolina. That really does explain <laughs> it. Um, yeah. um, I'm I'm just checking if there's any last um, questions um, before we wrap up. Um, but I, I, for one, I'm really looking forward to um, the PhD um, being written up and being able to read it and hear what you come, what um, conclusions you come to towards the end. Um, and I'm very um very much delighted to have facilitated um your session carolina um feel very fortunate indeed to have you here um and thank you for all the questions that people have put forward it's been a very interesting session <laughs>